Hello Steelers and welcome to this review of Foot Sloggers, uh, Peter Hart's latest Second World War book. This is based on, this is looking at the 16th Battalion, DLI, which is the Durham Light Infantry, obviously uh, from the northeast of England, but took in a lot of men from across the entire uh, United Kingdom. Uh, this is Peter's latest book, uh, coming hot on the heels of his book with Gary Bain, uh, Laugh or Cry about the First World War, and also part of, I think, uh, probably an unofficial trilogy, along with Burning Steel, which was about tankers of war, which I've done a review of recently, and also uh, the artillery section. I can't remember which one exactly that is, but there's three books now, so you've got the artillery, the tanks, and the infantry in foot sluggers here. I was very fortunate to be sent this by the uh, the printers, uh, the publishers, uh, publisher, uh, publishers, sorry, by uh, Profile Books. Uh, they sent me a review copy, and I just finished reading it, so I thought, well. I'll do a review of it. They were very nice to send it to me. Uh, they've also sent me a press release here, which I will do. I'll read this word for word for you, just so you've got it here. Uh, it says here, the only way to truly understand what it was like to fight in the Second World War is to listen to the experiences of those men who were there on the ground, and often there was nowhere more dangerous to be. In the 1980s, Peter Hart and his colleagues at the Imperial War Museum embarked on an extraordinary project to reconstruct one battalion's war in staggering detail based on interviews with remaining members. The soldiers of the 16th DLI were ordinary men in an extraordinary war. From their ragtag beginnings to nerve-shredding close shaves, shellings and painful losses during the North African and Italian campaigns, the toll on each and every one of them was intense. The challenges of dealing with not just physical suffering but mental anguish could, not be, could be unbearable. Combining a gripping history with eyewitness testimony, foot sloggers is a human look at the inhuman nature of war. And then just to bring it up here, it says Peter Hart was the oral historian of the Imperial War Museum for nearly 40 years. A distinguished military history author, he's acted as an army guide, runs his own battlefield tour company, and has a successful weekly podcast series, Pete's and Gary's Military History, which I urge you to check out because it is absolutely brilliant. They've just finished uh, a massive uh, section on Jutland, uh, which I knew very little about and I now know a lot more about. They are also currently looking at foot sloggers as well in a little bit of detail there but the, uh, the amount they're going into on the, uh, the the podcast is basically a taster of the book so it's well worth buying the book as well as listening to the podcast. I'm going to be, I've I'm been uh, not listening to it simply because I was trying to read the book first. I'll go back and I will listen to it again because it'll give me a, a reminder of what I've read and what I've gone through with these men almost. So just to give you a, a very brief breakdown really of the book itself, I mean it starts with their training uh, up in the north uh, as men are, are, are being shifted into the, uh, the battalion itself, the 16th DLI. They then go on to uh, fight in the Battle of uh, Sedigine, which is uh, North Africa. It's quite a bit covered in North Africa because they also take part in the advance of Tunis as well. But the main part of the book and the largest uh, actions that the DLI took part in, or the 16th to put some part in at least, was the fighting in Italy in 43-44. So we got the Salerno landings, which they took part in. They also fought around Naples. Monte Camino, not Monte Cassino, Monte Camino. Uh, they also then disappear off to the Middle East. Uh, they are then uh, trucking around in Cairo, but they also go to Tel Aviv as well, which is quite interesting because there's quite a lot of tensions there between the Palestinians and uh, the Israelis at the time. So they were taking part in policing actions there, which is very interesting. I'll come back to that in a second, well, in a little bit. Then they go back, they fight on the Gothic line, which was absolute horror uh, fighting. I think that's the winter of 44, 45. I think, or 43, 44, I could get that wrong. Uh, don't remind, don't, uh, don't, don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll put a, a caption up to say which it is, I can't exactly remember. But they're fighting there in horrific conditions in the winter, uh, getting snowed on, getting rained on continually, and it's, and it's some of the worst conditions of the war, actually, which are more like the conditions of the First World War that these men are fighting in, something terrible. Uh, they also fight a Casina, and that's basically where they're in their war. However, the book then goes on a little further and takes them beyond the war, and it actually takes them to the uh, where they are being used as basically as policemen in Greece. 
Now this is a part of their uh, of the First World War history. I didn't actually a uh, Second World War history. Sorry, that I didn't actually know. Uh, so it's opened my eyes completely to uh, the British Army being used as a police force as uh, various aspects of Greeks uh, Greek political. Uh, parties were a political entity, should I say, were all vying for uh, attention and trying to take control of Greece. And they were then ended, ended up basically again being used almost as policemen. And that very much, that part of the book very, was very interesting because it very much reminded me of things like the Troubles in Northern Ireland where British soldiers were being used basically to patrol poli uh, the, the areas uh, of. of uh, of, of issues that were going on in Northern Ireland between the two different communities there. And that was, you know, real parallels between the two. It's almost as though things have never changed. And similar again, really, to the to the parts where they're in Tel Aviv uh, patrolling the areas there as well, you know, only for a short time, but there were still, you know, there were still tensions and still uh, community tensions amongst those. Peter had already written a book called The Heat of Battle about the 16th DLI, but that was very much focused on the actual fighting that the men did, and it's a much shorter book as well, and there's fewer interviews in it than this one. This is a real uh, huge uh, undertaking of uh, you know pushing that beyond so it's well worth actually picking that up Peter Ball it's a good book as well it's quite but it's only quite short a couple hundred pages I read it a few years ago this comes in at almost 400 pages looking at uh, 389 pages in total in this one of writing and then you've also got obviously all your uh, bibliography and also sources and everything as well on the back of it but it is a big book full of stuff we've got just quickly show you the book itself uh, there's a couple of maps. This is probably the thing that I like the least. These maps are really good. However, there are no maps of North Africa and they do spend quite a lot of time in North Africa and I don't know the areas that they're talking about. This is concentrated mainly on Italy. I would have thought maybe just one more map page at least just, just to show some of the areas in North Africa where they're fighting which are mentioned in the text. We do get several pages of photographs of the DLI themselves and some of the men as well uh, with them actually you know named as well in the photographs which is always great because it's nice to put a name uh, a face to a name that you read throughout and that is what this book is really about it's about memoirs it is a memoir book it's about its oral history it's based on Peter's work at the Imperial War Museum as the press release said this was to compile a history of the 16th DLI, a single battalion. Now, I've mentioned this before in other videos. Uh, from a historical point of view, memoirs and uh, recollections can be quite problematic because how somebody remembers something can be very different to how somebody else remembers something when they're at the same event. However, Peter, being a very good historian, always corroborates any evidence, uh, any any. Uh, any historical facts that these uh, these memories bring up, so these you can you know you can basically rely on the fact that he has looked into pretty much everything that these men have said, chased up any of the details that he can find as well, and if there is something that's conjectural, he mentions it, and that is a great thing. You know, it's just the fact to say that they may not you know these memories may not be perfect and I think that is you know that from a historical point of view that's a really good way of doing things there are other authors out there that you know just take the men's word uh, for example there is a lot of historical criticism about uh, Stephen Ambrose and his taking the men of Easy Company's word as Bible as, as, uh, as fact uh, and not checking it or double checking or anything Peter doesn't do that, and he certainly, you know, he's this is really solid history. Uh, it is based on, uh, as I say, on memories, on their recollections, and also just on their uh, their interviews with Peter throughout the. I think it was the nineteen eighties. Uh, from remember, yeah. So he, you know, he went round, got uh, got as many names as he could, and then uh, basically interviewed those men, and then, as I say, corroborated those those facts, uh, those memories with facts. Now, obviously, again, that draws up some things because it, this has a bit of survivor bias in that obviously the men that are killed in the battalion during the war can't speak. So you only get, you know, them mentioned as they are getting mentioned by the people who have been interviewed in here. 
which obviously you know is a bit of an issue you're only getting the people that go through it the lucky ones I suppose or the ones who you know who were who, who, uh, who just avoided German bullets uh, in that war so there is that slight balance uh, slight bias but it doesn't detract really from the war from it as well and although these are specific very specific you know individuals memories of things they are also backed up as well with quite you know an overarching history as well which the, each of the chapters he talks about what is happening around so you can actually put these men's experiences into context with the greater war basically and with the 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 the, the the things that are happening around them that, that are forcing them to go on and it's quite interesting as well from a point of view uh, the, the one of the, the chapters that really stood out to me is uh, I think it's called how did they cope let me just double check it for you and uh, how would uh, could you have coped and this really just completely removes the men from any particular historical point of view and just talks about their actual experiences under fire um, you know, it doesn't matter where they are, if you're getting fired at, you're getting fired at. And that really goes into exactly, you know, how they thought about it, how they were dealing with it, what they would do to, uh, to, to deal with those situations and how they got through them. And I think that is a really interesting one. It's a similar, there's a similar chapter in the Burning Steel book where it talks about, you know, the men's experiences fighting in tanks. And it's a real eye opener because that is very visceral, very... Uh, very very uh, personal uh, and up close as well you also get the confusion of commanding here as well I mean this is one of the things you get to follow several men as they go through their war uh, some of them are injured and drop out throughout the book but some of them stay in for uh, throughout the entire book and throughout the entire war as they did and you get the confusion of command, you know, from some of them as well. Uh, some of the uh, the majors, for example, you know, not knowing, uh, being told to do something, and then getting the men grumbling at them because they don't they don't want to do it, but they've been told from the uh, the, uh, the the line lines of command from above them, you know, and the you can see then just that issue of command, the fact that they they know. Uh, putting men into the line at that particular issue at uh, that particular time is going to be an issue however they've been ordered to do it so therefore they have to order their men to do it despite them knowing that these things may not turn out to be perfect so there's really you know it's really interesting from that point of view as well it really is the man on the spot uh, the 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 that lone lone lonely command basically of you know the the uh, the field commander pushing his men forward uh, as a battalion would be, you know, for the different companies and things. And, he's, uh, and it goes everywhere from majors all the way down to privates. They're all mentioned in here and they're all given their, their same space to speak, basically, within the book. And I think that is a terrific part of it as well. That is well, something that is well worth thinking about. For Wargamers, obviously it's a Wargaming channel, so I'm going to talk about it from a Wargaming point of view. This, to me, again, I play a lot of Too Far Lardy's games, as you are aware, Chain of Command for example, I have been shot on a lot of those, they are based very much on command and on those individuals who do command and this really brings to light what is happening, you know, the friction of the battlefield, uh, the fact that they're fighting against the fog of war. The fact that you know they're trying to keep command control and communications going throughout uh, fighting against those two Fs, the fog and the friction, and this really brings it home in this book. As I said, I've already mentioned you know the the vagaries of command, the difficulties of command, and this really, really, really uh, just punches that home. Really, that that is this is what battlefield manoeuvre is about. It's not about units; it's about individuals, and it's about men taking decisions and doing things and making sure those things are done as much as they can be uh, to the best of their abilities and as I say that real that part of it really really comes to life in this book I think it's excellent really good uh, it's part of the Second World War that I know very little about to be perfectly honest I know uh, you know I've read the previous DLI book so I had a bit of a background in it and some of the things came back to me even though I'd read that a few years ago uh, just uh, I, I recalled a couple of the the things that happen in here but obviously I've, I've previously read about them but this one just goes in a little bit more depth and also as I say takes the scope 
of the men from their training all the way up to the end of the war and beyond what they all did afterwards as well and the fact that you know it's it's real testament to these men that Peter went have met you know it was a great generation and these guys a lot of them just went back into civil life and you know almost faded into obscurity apart from you know when they when they met up with their um, with their other pals at the uh, the battalion dinners and things each year that they had, and just you know recalling those those old times, uh, and even that is mentioned towards the end as well. So you know it gives you everything basically from uh, literally from you know you not even be able to march in step to the guys meeting up at their reunion dinners uh, in, into the sixties and seventies and and onwards. And the, on top of that as well, I mean, I mentioned it already, Peter is a really good writer. He writes really well. He's really readable. It is, you know, I hate to use the phrase, but it is a page turner. You know, you want to know what's going to happen next. And although, you know, a large chunk of this is the men's memories, there is also a large chunk of this, which is Peter's writings. And this is, these are his words as well as theirs. And I think, you know, the two work really, really well together. This is not dry history. History doesn't have to be dry to be interesting or enjoyable. And this really is worth it. Check it out. I shall put a link in the description down below. Uh, do get yourself a copy. Uh, you will spend a good few hours, uh, a good few weeks. Yeah, well, I, it took me quite a few, quite a long time to get through this because I was busy. But I did take quite a while to get through it. But I've enjoyed every minute of reading it, and, and I've just enjoyed going back to it as well when I have put it down. So I will say, this is thoroughly recommended by the Storm Steel Wargaming Channel. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you have, go and check out my other reviews of Peter's other books and also other bits and pieces as well on the reviews playlist. Uh, there's other things out there. Uh, I'm going to do more book reviews as I get them in the future, so do check out those as well at some point whenever they're done. And I will see you in the next video.